The Origin of Capitalism, A Longer View, by Ellen Meeksons Wood. Part 2, The Origin of Capitalism. Chapter 4, Commerce or Capitalism. The transition from feudalism to capitalism is typically treated as a general European or at least Western European process. Yet European feudalism in Europe was internally diverse and it produced several different outcomes, only one of which was capitalism. It is not just a matter of different rates of, quote, combined and uneven development, or even of different transitional phases. The autonomous city-states that prospered in medieval and Renaissance Italy, for example, or the absolutist state in France, were distinct formations, each with its own internal logic of process that need not have given rise to capitalism. Where and when they did issue in capitalism, it was only as they came within the orbit of an already existing capitalist system and the competitive pressure it was able to impose on its political, military, or commercial rivals. No entry into the capitalist economy could thereafter be the same as earlier ones as they all became subject to a larger and increasingly international capitalist system. The tendency to take for granted that capitalism was an inevitable, if antagonistic, outgrowth of European feudalism is, as we have seen, rooted in the conviction that the autonomous town that grew within the interstices of feudalism's parcelized sovereignties was not only the natural enemy that would destroy the feudal system but also the cuckoo's egg within with within that within it that would give birth to capitalism to detach ourselves from that presupposition means first to disentangle capitalist from bourgeois and capitalism from the city. That sounded a little too aggressive. What do you think? I try to throw a little flavor in there, you know? Spice it up, get a little jazz. Next section. Towns and trade. The association of capitalism with cities is one of the most well-established conventions of Western culture. Capitalism is supposed to have been born and bred in the city. But more than that, the implication is that any city, with its characteristic practices of trade and commerce, is by its very nature potentially capitalist from the start. And only extraneous obstacles have stood in the way of any urban civilization giving rise to capitalism. Only the wrong religion the wrong kind of state, or other ideological, political, or cultural fetters tying the hands of the urban classes have prevented capitalism from springing up anywhere and everywhere since time immemorial, or at least since technology has permitted the production of adequate surpluses. What accounts for the development of capitalism in the West, according to this view, is the unique autonomy of its cities and of their quintessential class, the burrs, or bourgeois. In other words, capitalism emerged in the West less because of what was present than because of what was absent, constraints on urban economic practices. In those conditions, it took only a more or less natural expansion of trade to trigger the development of capitalism to its full maturity. All that was needed was a quantitative growth and the accumulation of wealth that came with it. The accumulation of wealth that came with it. 
which occurred almost inevitably with the passage of time. In some versions, of course, helped along, but not originally caused by the, quote, Protestant ethic. There is much that is questionable in these assumptions about the natural connection between cities and capitalism, but above all, the tendency to naturalize capitalism, to disguise its distinctiveness as a historically specific social form with a beginning and potentially an end. The tendency to identify capitalism with cities and urban commerce has, as we have seen, generally been more accompanied by an inclination to make capitalism appear a more or less automatic consequence of practices as old as human history or even the consequence of a, quote, natural inclination, in Adam Smith's words, to, quote, truck, barter, and exchange, end quote. Yet there have, throughout history, been a great many towns and a great deal of trade that never gave rise to capitalism. For that matter, there have been elaborate urban settlements, such as the temple cities of ancient empires, that have not been commercial centers. More particularly, there have been societies with advanced urban cultures, highly developed trading systems, and far-flung commercial networks that have made ample use of market opportunities, but have not systematically experienced what we have been calling market imperatives. These commercial powers have often produced a rich material and cultural infrastructure far in advance of developments in the European backwater that first gave rise to capitalism. No reasonable person would deny that in Asia, Africa, and the Americas, there were high civilizations, which in some cases developed commercial practices as well as technological advances of various kinds that far surpassed those of medieval England. But the emergence of capitalism is difficult to explain precisely because it bears no relation to prior superiority or more advanced development in commercial sophistication, science and technology, or primitive accumulation in the classical sense of material wealth. Nor was the autonomy of the cities the decisive factor. Free urban communes in Europe may have provided fertile ground for trade, prosperous boroughs, and urban patriciates, but there is no obvious correlation between the success of such autonomous commercial centers and the rise of capitalism. Vastly successful commercial city-states like Florence did not give rise to capitalism, while capitalism did emerge in England, whose cities, in the context of a precociously centralized monarchical state, were arguably among the least autonomous in Europe. The critical factor in the divergence of capitalism from all other forms of commercial society was the development of certain social property relations that generated market imperatives and capitalist laws of motion, which imposed themselves on production. The great non-capitalist commercial powers had producing classes, and especially peasants who remained in possession of their means of subsistence and land in particular. They were ruled and exploited by dominant classes in states that relied on extra-economic appropriation or politically constituted property of various kinds. The great civilizations were not systematically subjected to the pressure of competitive production and profit maximization. Excuse me. These great civilizations were not systematically subjected to the pressures of competitive production and profit maximization. The compulsion to reinvest surpluses and the relentless need to improve labor productivity associated with capitalism. In the next chapter, we shall explore more closely the social property relations that did produce the imperatives of capitalist development. But first, to delineate the difference between capitalism and non-capitalist commerce. Even at its most advanced and prosperous, let us look in very general outline at the logic of pre-capitalist trade. 
The simple logic of trade is exchange for reciprocal requirements. This can take place within a single community or among adjacent communities. And this simple logic can still operate where the direct exchange of products is replaced by circulation of commodities mediated by money. It does not by itself generate the need to maximize profit and even less to produce competitively. Beyond such simple acts of exchange, there are more complex transactions between separate markets involving commercial profit making, buying cheap in one market and selling dear in another market, in the process of conveyance from one market to another or arbitrage between two markets. This kind of trade may have a logic different from the simple exchange of reciprocal requirements, at least to the extent that requirements of commercial profit intervene. But here, too, there is no inherent and systematic compulsion to transform production. Even in pre-capitalist societies, there are, of course, people who live by profit-taking. People who make a living by profitable trade. But the logic of non-capitalist production does not change simply because profit-seeking middlemen, even highly developed merchant classes, intervene. The merchant strategies need have nothing to do with the transforming production in the sense required by capitalist competition. Profit by means of carrying trade or arbitrage between markets has strategies of its own. These do not depend on transforming production, nor do they promote the development of the kind of integrated market that imposes competitive imperatives. On the contrary, they thrive on fragmented markets and movement between fragmented markets, markets rather than competition within a single market, and the links between production and exchange may be very tenuous. The trading network of medieval and early modern Europe, for instance, depended on a degree of local or regional specialization that allowed merchants to profit by carrying goods from one locale where they were produced to others where they were not produced or not in adequate quantities to say nothing of their ventures much further afield in a growing network of long distance trade. But here is elsewhere in the non-capitalist world through profit, though profit seeking was a common and highly developed activity, it was separate from, if not actually opposed to, efficient production. Fierce commercial rivalries certainly existed, both between major economic powers and even within major economic powers among their cities and local merchants. There was even major wars over trade. But these rivalries generally had less to do with competitive production of the capitalist kind than with the extra economic factors, such as superior shipping, domination of the seas and other transport routes, monopoly privileges, or highly developed financial institutions and instruments of arbitrage, typically supported by military force. Some of these extra economic advantages, such as those in shipping, or indeed military superiority, certainly depended on technological innovations, but this is not a matter of a systematic need to lower the cost of production in order to prevail in price competition. Even later than the 1600s, most of the world, including Europe, was free of market imperatives. A vast system of trade certainly existed, extended across the globe, but nowhere, neither in the great trading centers of Europe nor in the vast commercial networks of the non-European world was economic activity and production, in particular, driven by the imperatives of competition and accumulation. The dominant principle of trade everywhere was not surplus value derived from production, but profit on alienation, buying cheap and selling dear. International trade is the economic activity that above all created the great commercial centers, which are, according to all versions of the commercialization model, supposed to have been the precursors of capitalism. This is essentially carrying trade, with merchants buying goods in one location to be sold for a profit in another location, or, quote, commercial arbitrage between separate markets, end quote. I don't know who's that quote that is. Maybe Marx. I don't know. But even within a single powerful 
and relatively unified European kingdom like France, basically the same principles of non-capitalist commerce prevailed. There was no single and unified market, a market in which people made profit not by buying cheap and selling dear, not by carrying goods from one market to another, but by producing more cost-effectively in direct competition with others in the same market. The trade that created great commercial power tended to be in luxury goods. Oh, excuse me. The trade that created great commercial power tended to be in luxury goods, or at least goods destined for more prosperous households or answering to the needs and consumption patterns of dominant classes. There was no mass market for cheap everyday consumer products such as the market that had, would later drive the industrial capitalism of Britain. Peasant producers typically produced not only their own food, but also other everyday goods like clothing. There was, to be sure, a market in food, and peasants might take their surpluses to local markets where the proceeds could be exchanged for other commodities. Farm produce might even be sold in markets further afield, and commerce, per commerce particularly in grain, was very extensive, especially to supply urban populations. But here again, the principles of trade were basically the same as in manufactured goods. With profits deriving from advantage in the process of circulation, more than from cost-effective and competitive production, the kind of trade in luxury goods for a fairly limited market did not in itself carry a systematic impulse to improve productivity. But, as we shall see in a moment, it was not unique in this respect. Even trade in basic necessities, like grain, was governed by the same principles of profit and circulation rather than production, and for that matter, its development was dependent on commerce and luxury goods. In all kinds of trade, the main vocation of the large merchant was circulation rather than production, and the main commercial advantages were extra economic. Even when a major commercial center, like Florence, a case to which we shall re return, developed domestic urban production, largely the, pr the production of luxury goods for a relatively limited market, in addition to its role in servicing external mercantile activity, the basic logic of economic transactions was not essentially different. It was still a matter of recycling wealth or profit on alienation in the process of circulation rather than the creation of value in production and the appropriation of surplus value in the capitalist manner. These non-capitalist principles of trade existed in conjunction with non-capitalist modes of production. For instance, in Western Europe, even where feudal serfdom had effectively disappeared, other forms of extra-economic exploitation still prevailed. Even monetary rents in pre-capitalist societies were based on extra-economic power. In 18th century France, for example, where peasants still constituted the vast majority of the population and remained in possession of most land, office in the central state served as an economic resource for many members of the dominant classes. <clears throat> this means of extracting surplus labor in the form of taxes from peasant producers even rent-appropriating landlords typically depended on various extra-economic powers and privileges to enhance their wealth. So peasants had direct access to the means of production, the land, while landlords and office holders, with the help of various extra-economic powers and privileges, extracted surplus labor from peasants directly in the form of rent or tax. While all kinds of people might buy and sell all kinds of things in the market, Neither the peasant proprietors who produced, nor the landlords and office holders who appropriated what others produced, depended directly on the market for the conditions of their self-reproduction, and the relations between them were not mediated by the market. It was, as we shall see in the next chapter, a fundamental change in these social property relations, a change that made producers, appropriators, and the relations between them market-dependent, that would bring about capitalism. Commerce and Basic Necessities While well, much of the world's population since the emergence of agriculture has been devoted to the production of food, there have always been those who, for one, oh, excuse me, I'm like spacing out for a second, Jesus Christ. 
Next section, commerce and basic necessities. While much of the world's population, since the emergence of agriculture, has been devoted to production of food, there have always been those who, for one reason or another and in various ways, have depended on others to produce it for them. The distribution of food from producers to non-producing consumers has taken many different forms, from gifts for relationships or the obligations of kinship, to distribution by the state, as in the ancient Roman grain dole, to coercive appropriation by means of superior force of one kind or another. But trade in foodstuffs has obviously been a very widespread human practice. Control of the food supply has also been a major source of power and wealth, and merchants have grown rich by cornering such trade. The commerce in food has ranged from local markets in which peasants have exchanged their surpluses for other commodities to large-scale trade at greater distances, such as the massive European trade in grain. But, a widespread, but as widespread and ancient as the trade in food has been, its development to a major feature of social existence depended on the growth of cities with large concentrations of people not engaged in the production of their own food. In our exploration of the relation between capitalism and the city, and our critical examination of the commercialization model of capitalist development, we can learn a great deal by scrutinizing the different ways in which the trade in food has figured in the larger economic scheme of things. It will be argued in the next chapter that capitalism was born when market imperatives seized hold of food production, the provision of life's most irreducible necessity. But before we reach that point, it might be useful, by way of contrast, to sketch out a different case, not one in which the market played no role or only a minor one, but on the contrary, one in which commerce was an essential condition of subsistence and social reproduction, yet where market imperatives were still not in play. We should not take for granted that extensive commerce, even in the most basic necessities, always carries with it the imperatives of competitive production, profit maximization, and the relentless development of the productive forces. In the commercialization model, international trade, based in medieval and early modern Europe, was supposed to be the foundation of capitalist development. So let us consider the role played here by the trade in food. There is a well-established network of commerce in food. There was a well especially grain, that joined certain European food-producing regions with other parts of Europe unable to produce enough for their own consumption, particularly and mainly for people living in towns, a growing urban population in parts of the continent, and especially in the major commercial centers, created not only a growing market for luxury goods supplied increasingly by long-distance trade beyond the borders of Europe, but also a market for very basic subsistence needs that their own domestic agriculture was unable to meet. These needs are supplied above all by imported good grain, especially from the Baltic region. This trade in grain, a major feature of international trade, was conducted according to the principles of pre-capitalist commerce. Mercantile profit depended on bringing commodities from one market to another and was enhanced by the differences between the price of purchase in the producing regions and the price of sale in wealthy consuming regions. Grain could, for example, be bought cheap in the Baltic and sold relatively dear in the Dutch Republic, though cheap by local standards, whose merchants came to dominate the Baltic trade. There is another sense, too, in which the grain trade bore the marks of pre-capitalist commerce. Imported grain was certainly an essential condition of commercial success in the major European trading powers, but the grain trade was not itself the motor of European trading system, of the European trading system, system, whose fortunes were always dependent on the fate of the luxury trade and the wealth of the prosperous consumers that impelled it. It is even possible to argue that the need for a massive trade in grain was determined by the luxurious consumption patterns of the wealthier classes, in the sense that the grain-consuming 
urban population of Europe was swelled by people servicing the opulent living and conspicuous consumption of richer consumers. In the Middle Ages, international trade was driven by the wealth of the landed aristocracy, whose consumption patterns, their hunger for luxuries, as well as for the instruments of extra-economic coercion, especially military goods on which their economic power depended, dictated the logic of the commercial system. Quote, the landed aristocracy, writes Rodney Hilton, quote, whether lay or ecclesiastical, constituted at ta all times the principal market for a range of products, mainly luxuries, which entered into international trade. International trade, of course, dealt also in bulk commodities like grain and timber, but the demand for these was mainly urban and probably depended ultimately on the health of the international trade in luxuries. End quote. Rodney Hilton. Even later, with the growth of towns and prosperous burr classes, the same fundamental logic prevailed. Many more people, many of them poor, came to depend for the subsistence on cheap imported grain. But the international trading system of pre-capitalist Europe continued to be driven by the wealth and wants of prosperous consumers, as well as the needs of the state not by the consumer needs and powers of those who entered the market above all to acquire the basic means of survival and self-reproduction, whether food or other commodities of everyday life, from inexpensive textiles to cheap cooking pots. The point can be illustrated by considering the disjunction between commercial power in Europe and the trade in grain. The production and export of grain, as essential as it was to European subsistence, was not until Britain broke the pattern, an index of wealth and economic power. It was even more even, it was even, as Marx once put it, the function of those, quote, left behind in Europe's economic development. A division of labor developed between Europe's grain exporting regions and its richest trading powers, such as the Dutch Republic. But this division of labor was never a simple exchange of necessities between specialized regions, grain from the Baltic for, say, the dairy products of the Low Countries. While the Dutch role in the Baltic grain trade was certainly paramount, commercial power such as theirs derived not simply from commerce and basic necessities, but from trade in luxuries or relative luxuries consumed disproportionately by other rich commercial powers. The commercial system of pre-capitalist Europe, then, was characterized by a series of disjunctions. The geographic separation between the production of grain and grain's consumption by countries whose wealth derived from trade and other commodities, not even necessarily from the production of those commodities, but also, more particularly, from the conveyance, transshipment, and arbitrage of commodities produced elsewhere and revenues from entrepots. It is, as, it is as commercial mediators more than as producers of traded commodities that the great commercial powers gain their huge wealth. And this was reflected in an imbalance between the production of basic necessities and economic power derived from trade and luxuries. These disjunctions and imbalances were, needless to say, reinforced by the st basic practicalities of transport and communication. The whole system, indeed, was based on the fragmentation of markets, detachment of one market from another, the distance between sites of production and sites of consumption, the geographic separation of supply and demand. Mercantile wealth depended precisely on the relative inaccessibility of markets and the possibility of profiting from an endless process of arbitrage between fragmented markets. There was, then, a fundamental separation between consumption and production. The social conditions in which grain was produced in the exporting regions had very little to do with the conditions in which it was consumed in the rich commercial centers. This meant, among other things, 
that grain was cheap by the economic standards of the consuming powers, especially in the wealthy Dutch Republic, whose merchants and superior shipping dominated the Baltic trade, without the enchantment of productive for uh, without the enhancement of productive forces in the producing regions. Nor did low costs in the grain producing regions impose competitive pressures on the consuming economies that benefited from cheap imports. On the contrary, the costs of producing other commodities in those wealthy commercial economies were in effect reduced by access to such cheap basic inputs. At any rate, the trading advantages of the commercial leaders did not depend primarily on competitive, competitive production, but on extra economic factors such as monopoly privileges, superior shipping, sophisticated commercial practices and instruments, elaborate commercial networks, fat-flung, far-flung <laughs> far trading posts, and military might. These disjunctions certainly meant that, while rich commercial nations may have been dependent on the grain trade for the means of survival, the cost of the most basic survival needs was disproportionately low in relation to the wealth derived from commerce and less necessary goods. But the same disjunctions also meant that the commercial centers whose wealth depended on them were vulnerable to the, fragility, to the fragilities of the international trade in superfluous goods. Not only their great wealth, but even their supply of cheap and basic necessities could suffer from declines in the luxury trade. Florence and the Dutch Republic. Sweatshirt's coming off, baby. Within the European trading system, Jesus Christ. Within the European trading system, there emerged several very successful and prosperous commercial centers that, according to the commercialization model, should have been the birthplaces of capitalism. In fact, according to some versions of the model, they were indeed capitalist. Though for one reason or another, their further development was thwarted and they never went to the whole, the whole distance in industrial cap to industrial capitalism until Britain led the way. These are the so-called failed transitions. No one could deny that in the great European commercial centers, the wealth of the dominant classes rested on commerce, and that their appropriation of surpluses from direct producers did not here take the classic form of feudal rent. But here too, as in other pre-capitalist societies, great wealth still depended on politically constituted property. And here too, this form of appropriation shaped the particular and self-limiting course of economic development. Urban patriciates, or merchant elites, in commercial centers in medieval and early modern Europe often extracted great wealth from commercial activities, and they relied to large, in a large part on the privileges and powers associated with their status in the city. The success of these commercial centers, as we have seen, was dependent less on competitive production than on extra economic factors. Ruling elites in these centers depended on their civic status not only for privileged access to such extra economic commercial advantages, but typically also as office holders for exploitation of domestic producers by means of direct extra economic surplus extraction in the form of rents, dues, and taxes of one kind or another, so much so that cities of this kind have been described as collective lordships. This is true even in cases like Florence, whose commercial wealth was based not only on trade in foreign goods, but also on its own domestic products. Florence, 
is a favorite with those preoccupied with failed, quote, failed transitions. Because it was m such a remarkably successful commercial power, and also because of its dazzling cultural riches as the quintessential home of the so-called Renaissance. On any measure of commercial sophistication, domestic manufacture, or cultural achievement, Florence at that time far surpassed England, yet that northern backwater was then on the verge of its capitalist development, while the opulent Italian city-state failed to take that route. In relation to the surrounding countryside, the city of Florence was certainly a collective lordship, exploiting peasant producers in the cantado no less than the absolutist state in France did in its own peasants. At the same time, the success of Florentine trade in its own manufactured commodities continued to depend on extra economic factors, on monopoly privileges, or on especially sophisticated commercial and financial practices. Double-entry bookkeeping is supposed to have originated there, which facilitated a commerce in goods whose success in a luxury market, in any case, had less to do with cost-effective production than with the skills of craftsmanship. Not the least significant trait of the Florentine economy was that its greatest commercial families, notably the Medici, moved into more lucrative, non-productive enterprises, such as financial services for monarchs and popes, not to mention public office up to and including dynastic rule of the city-state itself. As successful as such commercial centers were for a time, and as great as the wealth they amassed, their economic development was self-limiting. It is obviously true that the market played a central role in their development, but it seems just as clear that here it really did function more as an opportunity than as an imperative. At least the market did not operate here in such a way as to create the relentless capitalist drive to maximize profit by developing the forces of production. It may be possible to argue, as I would be inclined to do, that the non-capitalist character of such commercial economies was as much their strength as their weakness, and that, for instance, the Italian Renaissance, which flourished in the environment of commercial city-states in northern Italy, like Florence, would not have achieved its great heights under the pressures of capitalist imperatives. But that is another story. The point here is simply that, in the absence of those imperatives, the pattern of economic development was bound to be different. Whereas the necessary productive capacities were present, the market, especially for luxury goods, was available. The dominant classes were willing and able to encourage and exploit not only commerce, but also production. Merchants even organized and invested in production. Yet the appropriation of great wealth still depended on extra economic powers and privileges and far less on developing productive forces than on refining and extending the forces of appropriation. A system of this kind would inevitably respond to declining market opportunities, not by enhancing labor productivity and improving cost effectiveness, but by squeezing producers harder, or by withdrawing altogether from production in favor of more extra economic powers of appropriation. The case of the Dutch Republic in the 16th and 17th centuries is probably the most complex. It is the case for which the strongest argument can be made as a rival to England's claims as the first modern or capitalist economy. Its commercial wealth and cultural achievements were enormous. It pioneered some of the most sophisticated commercial practices and instruments in banking, stock trading, and financial speculation to say nothing of its technical capacities in shipping and its military successes. Even its technological development in enhancing productivity for a time exceeded all others in Europe, and the English borrowed 
many of its agricultural advances. It had an exceptionally large urban population and seems to have been the most highly commercialized society in history before the advent of capitalism. It was unusually dependent on trade to provide the most basic conditions of subsistence even for direct producers. More particularly, even its agricultural producers depended on trade to an unprecedented degree for basic subsistence needs, acquiring grain in the market by selling their own commodities, in particular dairy products. There can be no doubt that the great wealth of the Republic was founded on commerce, or that Dutch commercial elites invested in domestic production, notably in agriculture, in unprecedented ways and to an unprecedented degree. For these reasons, the Dutch Republic is an even greater favorite than Florence as a, quote, failed transition, and many explanations have been offered for the fact that the Dutch did not take the leap to industrial capitalism as the English were to do. Some have put this down to the parasitic stranglehold of top-heavy cities, which it is argued eventually suppressed Dutch productivity, especially in agriculture, by squeezing it for rentier wealth. Others may emphasize the ways in which the cities did invest in production, and specifically productive agriculture, yet attribute the failed transition to the Republic's dependence on the export market and hence on the larger European economy, which dragged the Dutch down with it, with it when it went into decline. Yet another explanation is that the Dutch decline was just a typical secular downturn such as affects all modern economies. Modern in quotes. It could just be argued that, even when such explanations proceed from the premises of the commercialization model, they also tend to undermine it by treating the Republic's apparently excessive commercialization and urbanization as an obstacle to further development. But an alternative explanation might be that the Dutch failed to follow the expected course of capitalist development because it was not in its essence a capitalist economy, and was driven by a different economic logic. It is beyond the scope of this book to enter the debate about the Dutch economy. For our purpose, it is enough to point out some of the most important ways in which its pattern of development displayed the logic of a pre-capitalist economy. The Dutch may have different... Uh, excuse me. The Dutch may have differed from other European powers in the extent to which they relied on the market even for their basic food supplies. But the commercial system in which they operated was still the pre-capitalist economy that characterized Europe as a whole. This is true not only in the sense that the Dutch were largely dependent on the European market, not the least the market in luxury goods and subject to its limitations, but also in the sense that the Dutch economy itself was dominated not by capitalist producers, but by the commercial interest of merchants whose principal vocation, even when they invested in agriculture or industry, was circulation rather than production. Perhaps the most important factor in the Dutch economy was the dominance of the city and the interest of urban elites, which also, also shaped the rural economy not only as a large market for agricultural products, but also as a source of investment. The great wealth and commercial power of the Republic depended disproportionately on its preeminence in international trade, conveying and marketing goods produced elsewhere. Without its leading role in international trade, and without the great wealth derived from Europe's growing luxury markets, the Dutch could not have developed either their huge urban population or indeed their productive agriculture. This was not so much a case in which agricultural productivity sustained an unusually large urban population as it occurred in England, but rather a case in which an unusually large urban population sustained by a dominant role in international trade as a major link in the European commercial chain 
also provided the conditions for a productive agriculture. Despite its reliance on circulating goods produced elsewhere, the Republic did trade in its own domestic commodities. During the Golden Age, there was a substantial connection between Dutch commercial interests and domestic production. With wealth plowed, excuse me, during the Golden Age, there was a substantial connection between Dutch commercial interests and domestic production. With urban wealth plowed into the countryside, most dramatically in massive land reclamation projects. But that connection between commerce and production was, so to speak, always at one remove and subject to disruption the moment the market for Dutch products declined. The Dutch constructed their commercial empire on the strength of other advantages outside the sphere of production. Nor is it clear that Dutch producers and farmers in particular, who were deeply engaged in production for the market, were subject to the competitive imperatives we associate with capitalism. Here, for example, the influence of low-cost grain-producing regions, which benefited the Dutch even more than other economies, if anything reduced competition, competitive pressures by lowering the cost of basic inputs, allowing Dutch farmers to produce and market their own higher cost products, not basic grain, but relative luxuries like dairy products and meat. The Republic owed this advantage in importing cheap inputs to its dominance of the Baltic trade. A commercial advantage that was not based on competitive cost of production at home. Like other commercial leaders in Europe, before the dominance of capitalist Britain, the Dutch typically relied, for their success in international trade, on extra economic superiority in negotiating separate markets, rather than on competitive production in a single market, on dominance in shipping and command of trade routes, on monopolies in trading privileges, on an elaborate network of far-flung trading posts and settlements on the development of sophisticated financial practices and instruments. These extra economic advantages often relied heavily on military force. The rising Dutch Republic devoted much of its massive tax revenue to military expenditures, which accounted for more of the state's expenses than did any other activity. The Dutch engaged in some notorious military exercises for purely commercial advantage, not only aggressive trade wars, but also such ventures as the seizure in 1602 of a Portuguese ship with an enormously valuable cargo of unprecedented proportions, apparently large enough to affect the future course of Dutch development, or the Amboina massacre of English merchants in the Moluccas. When the European economy declined in the late 17th century and the market for Dutch exports went with it, the link between commerce and domestic production that had marked the Golden Age was drastically weakened and the Dutch fell back on their main strength, their commercial sophistication, together with its extra economic supports. So the Dutch, like other European economies, came up against the barriers of the old commercial system in the crisis of the 17th century. For all their agricultural success, and for all their trade in basic commodities, the Dutch always belonged to an economy still subject to the limitations of the pre-capitalist market, not least its disproportionate dependence on luxury consumption by the wealthy few. The pre-capitalist character of the Dutch economy is visible in other ways too. Perhaps the most important is the extent to which the Dutch ruling class depend on extra economic modes of appropriation for its wealth. One of the most striking characteristics of the Dutch social structure was the predominance of public office as a source of private wealth. 
One of the most striking characteristics of the Dutch social structure was the predominance of public office as a source of private wealth, the decentralized organization of the republic, with fairly autonomous provinces and cities, created a particularly fertile field for public service occupations, so the proportion of such occupations in the population of Dutch cities was very high. But more than the sheer number of offices, the most remarkable thing is the wealth associated with them. Lucrative offices were an important resource for the Dutch ruling class. I'm sorry if that last paragraph didn't make any sense at all. I like completely spaced out while I was reading it. All of a sudden I was at the end of the paragraph reading and I was like, how did I get here? So I hope it wasn't terrible. Lucrative offices were an important resource for the Dutch ruling class, even in the golden age of the Republic's commercial dominance, when wealthy landowners or financiers would often choose to use their wealth for access to such offices, even abandoning other economic activities while enriching themselves by means of large salaries associated with office, together with other advantages and privileges. In the 17th century, the financial and social advantages of office and city government were particularly significant, and after 1660, when the Dutch economy, together with the European economy in which it was firmly embedded, went into a decline, the value of this source of wealth became even more highly prized. In Holland, for instance, the wealth of the urban pat patriciate was greater than that of any other group and the bulk of the province's most lucrative occupations were in public office of some kind. In this sense, the Dutch Republic had much in common with other non-capitalist societies that relied on extra-economic exploitation or politically constituted property, such as the tax office state of French absolutism, in which office was a means of extracting surplus labor from peasants by means of taxation, or whose wealthy city states that act or those or excuse me, or those wealthy city states that acted as collective lordships in relation to their adjacent countryside. The mode of appropriation may be important in explaining the so called quote failed transition. While the English, driven as we shall see in the following chapters, by the distinctive market imperatives, by distinctive market imperatives, responded to the European crisis and the decline of agricultural prices by investing to increase labor productivity and cost effectiveness in agriculture. In the Dutch Republic, during and after the 17th century crisis, there was a process of agricultural disinvestment. As agricultural prices declined, Dutch elites became even more interested in other sources of wealth, such as enhanced extra-economic commercial advantages or public office, which is more lucrative than investment in land or in other productive enterprises. While investment in technologies to enhance labor productivity was not altogether lacking, it was far from being the preferred response to declining market opportunities. More attractive to the wealthy elites were extra-economic strategies and investment in politically constituted property, not only office, but also such attempts to revive monopoly privileges as the re-establishment of the West India Company or one company's monopoly on navigational charts. Nor did the Republic neglect the military dimension of its commercial policy. Wait, hold on. Nor did the Republic neglect the military dimension of its commercial policy. Perhaps the most perhaps the most striking example is the Dutch role in England's so-called quote glorious revolution of 1688. The province of Holland, in particular, depended on the profitability of commerce and therefore was especially affected by the incursions of French mercantilism in the late 17th century. Its interference with Dutch ships 
with its prohibitive tariffs, the only solution to this problem of commercial profitability was an extra economic defeat of French mercantilism. And this required an alliance with England, which was possible only with a friend and ally on the English throne. The Dutch Republic, therefore, committed its resources to supporting William of Orange's bid for the English monarchy. In a, quote, risky investment to use the one resource the Republic had in abundance, money, to reestablish an international environment in which the economy could once again prosper. End quote. I don't know who said the quote, though. The revolution may, to the English, seem glorious and largely bloodless. But from the Dutch point of view, it was an invasion. With the occupation of London by Dutch troops, in full expectation of a war, involving not only the English, but also the French. Yet this invasion was nothing more nor not less than a commercial enterprise. Not only the Dutch state, but the Amsterdam Stock Exchange invested in this ultimate use of extra economic power in pursuit of commercial profit. Thereafter, although commerce continued to be the major source of the Republic's wealth, it was increasingly detached from domestic production and more dependent than ever on commercial sophistication. In short, there seems to be a consistent pattern of reversion to, or intensification of, pre-capitalist commercial profit-taking or even non-capitalist forms of extra-economic appropriation, rentier wealth, and office holding. The level of commercial and technological development in the Dutch Republic set it apart from other European economies. It certainly pushed to their utmost limits the possibilities of commercialization, and it certainly made maximum use of market opportunities. The Republic undoubtedly relied on trade not only for its great wealth, but even for its basic food requirements. In that sense, it was certainly dependent on the market. Yet the fate of the Dutch economy ultimately depended not on the success or failure, the successes or failures of competitive producers, but on the interest of commercial profit takers and an elite of office holders. The market imperatives that generate a specifically capitalist pattern of development seem not to have operated in the Republic as they were to do in England. Again, as in the case of Florence, it is possible to argue that this absence was as much a strength as a weakness, and that the Dutch Republic enjoyed its golden age not as a capitalist economy, but as the last and most highly developed non-capitalist commercial society, owing its accomplishments no less to its commercial success than to its freedom from the constraints and contradictions of capitalism. But whatever possibilities such a commercial economy may or may not have contained, once capitalism did emerge elsewhere, it inevitably set the terms, for better or worse, for all economic development thereafter, not only in its birthplace, but throughout the world, especially once British capitalism assumed its industrial form, the competitive pressures it was able to impose on its rivals, either directly in commerce or by means of its military and geopolitical advantages, created new external pressures for similar developments elsewhere. England was at the outset less advanced in commerce and technology than its Dutch rival, but its further development, both its successes and its failures, was shaped by a distinctive system of social property relations, which made both producers and appropriators irreducibly dependent on competitive production. These property relations would set in motion a relentless compulsion to compete, to produce costs effectively cost-effectively, to maximize profit, to reinvest surpluses, 
and systematically to increase labor productivity by improving the productive forces. With that compulsion came all the contradictions of capitalism.